welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. And today, I'm actually not in Hanoi, Vietnam, but in Los Angeles, visiting my daughters. Uh, so I'm excited to be here today. And our guest is Hilary Desairs, um, author of Relaunch, Spark Your Heart, to ignite your life. Uh, I love the book, Hillary, and I'm so glad you're with us today. So, Hillary, tell us a little bit about your professional background. Well, Mark, first off, thank you for having me. And everyone who is here live, thank you for being here. I hope that it is well worth your time. So, from, from my background, I grew up in California. In fact, I have a daughter that uh, goes to school right where you are, Mark, at USC. She's about to graduate. Had another go to UCLA, so there's a big rivalry in our household. But I grew up in Silicon Valley, and I was a high-tech girl uh, working at Oracle for almost 10 years. And as I was literally having the successes that came with promotions and all of these accolades, I realized that there was something really missing. And what I call relaunches, which are these life things, business things, worldly things that are happening around us, I felt like things were like crushing me. I was, I got melanoma, I was getting a divorce, I was a single mom of three little kids. I had my grandparents die in a fatal car crash. It was just like, I'm sure that people can understand what I'm saying. I felt like I was in a pressure cooker and things were just, and, and I'm not even gonna go into all the other things that were going on too. And as I realized, you know what? Everybody has these relaunches and the stress and the impact that it has on us. And so many times we can't, we can't get out of it. So we can't kind of like, be able to separate ourselves from what's going on. And I thought, you know what, how am I going to get through this? I can't stop working. I can't stop being a mom. I can't stop being a family member. So I got to deal with this. I got to figure something out. And I ended up coming up with a process and a program and it was built around the president of Oracle went to a place called Kleiner Perkins, one of the top venture capital firms. And he called me up. I'd worked very closely with him on many, many opportunities at Oracle. And he said, Hillary, our executives are struggling with the whole work life balance, trying to grow a company, scale a company and still feel present around what they're what they are trying to grow, the why, how it was all going to shape itself out. And he said, I want you to come in and with John Doerr, and John Doerr is a legend in the venture capital space. And I want you to coach all of our execs, all of our portfolio companies. And then I want you to offer up, you know, advice. And I'm like, okay, I just had another baby at that point. It was all during this relaunch. And I thought, what am I really going to share? And it came out that in, in what I had always done, and I've always been a coach, even like I've been an executive coach for 23 years, I realized that it's not just about the head. And I was a logical person. I mean, being in that dog eat dog world, it was very much steps, procedures, systems, follow them or fail. And I thought, but that's not what I always did. How was I able to close 23 deals in one month? I didn't do it just by being step one, step two, or I wouldn't have, I would have run out of time. I did it by looking at the head, looking at the steps, but also I had this emotional connection to what I was doing, to the why, to the heart. And then I thought, you know, there also is this intuition of, wow, what's going on? And I didn't share with you, yes, I had a near-death experience when I was a young girl. And so I have this heightened heightened level of intuition, but I had kept pushing it down because it wasn't logical. It wasn't, it didn't make sense to me. So I ended up really thinking about, okay, these H's, all right, well, if 3HQ, which is what I coined it to be, is really the headquarters of you, you've got your three divisions, head, heart, higher self. How do I bring this to the world? 
how do I bring this to 150 executives in this room and simplify it and make them understand that if you only focus with the head, you're never going to reach that heightened level of a lifestyle of success. And so I did that and Mark, it ended up, it resonated with people. People were asking me like, yeah, you know, what you just said, I get, I'm totally working in my head, my marriage, my relationship, my relationship with my kids is terrible because I'm so focused, it's business or it's personal. And there's a delineation and I, I, I don't know how to create this harmony of all of them. And I'm like, okay, three HQ, that's how you do it. So I ended up launching, I, I did not go back to Oracle. I ended up launching a consulting business at that time. It wasn't called coaching. It was called consulting. And I did that for five years. And that got me into a point where my kids were aging into what we call tweens, which is that in between, you know, they're not the little kid anymore, but they're not the teenager. And I noticed that they were doing crazy things online. And I thought, you know what? I need to keep kids safe. And there was cyberbullying going on and I got invited to the White House to help with the task force. And it just spurred this whole idea around how do we have technology for kids and keep them safe. And so I did that and then it launched a bunch of other companies, but where I am now, which is the Relaunch Co, is I, I noticed that as I'm in my mid zone, middle age, and I love how Brene Brown actually defines middle age as 35 until you're dead. So you're dead. So, hey, I don't know about you, everybody, but I, 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 I see some pictures. I think we're all in the mid zone. Uh -huh. And I really, I, I wanted to help people be able to scale their businesses, be able to scale their lives, be able to take what I have now worked with thousands of people to be able to do. And I wanted to bring it on a more massive scale. And that, that's where, that's where you come in, Mark, and your incredible show around books. So I, I want to ask you, Sorry, if you had not gone through so much tragedy, mm -hmm. um, because I know I went through not quite as bad as you, but similar types of things, mm -hmm. and it reoriented my entire life, would you be doing this today? Mm. I have a feeling that the trajectory that I was on was not sustainable. I was completely burning out. I was getting home after I was, I was managing a very large group at Oracle financials, manufacturing. And I was there early in the morning. I was commuting. I was in the car an hour and a half each way. And I was getting home after they had gone to bed. And I've, again, I've already told you, and my marriage was completely, you know, non-existent at that point. We were right. already separated. And so I knew deep down inside of me that I had to make a change. I had to make a change for my own health because I was, I was very, very sick. And where I didn't understand what was happening with stress, I wasn't understanding, you know, I just thought, hey, I came from a, a family where you, you know, you work hard, you play hard, like work. It's about hard work. You have to work so hard in order to have that time off. And, and but when and I also, was having time off, I was exhausted. I was exhausted and run down. But also you, you were coming up during a time where there was a glass ceiling for women. That's okay. um, because of you and women of your generation. There is no real glass ceiling for women now. I mean, I'm in Vietnam. 80% of the entrepreneurs are, are women in Asia uh, and this particular country. Mm. And all the uh, CEOs of all the companies of Vingroup, the largest company with like over 20 companies, all of them are women. All mm. the CEOs are women. So, you know, you probably felt if you didn't work those kinds of hours, you wouldn't be taken seriously and couldn't move up the ladder, right? Well, there's a great story that I tell. I had just had my twins and I got a call from my vice president and he said, um, Hillary, I'm so excited. I, I literally, I think it was like two weeks after the babies were born. Hillary, I'm so excited. I, uh, you have a new manager when you come back in. There's a new vice president that's been hired. And I, I remember pausing and thinking, well, wait a second. I've only been out, I've only been out like literally less than four weeks. And wait, when did we, when was there even like a, a, a rec open for this? Like, I didn't even know 
that my manager was about to get promoted and leave. Right. And he said, oh yeah, you know, well, we didn't really inform you. And I said, but wait, I, I, I'm the next in line and I've had a lot of success and why wasn't I considered? And yes, there were, I think it was predominantly all men that I was working with. And he said, well, Hillary, you just had babies. You can't do that. And I said, well, wait a second, what? I said, I actually want to go for this position. He said, what? You know, you have to be here and do this and you'll have, you know, you know, so many of these different people, your number's going to be gigantic. Are you sure you want to? We've already hired this person. And I said, I want to, I deserve to, I'm the next in line. And you didn't even think to ask me. And I said, so I would like to talk to, I think it was his boss. And he's like, are you sure? And I'm like, absolutely. So I ended up, they ended up putting me through the process of going for this position. And guess what happened? I got it. Well, here's the biggest problem. I walk in and now that guy who had been given the job is now reporting directly to me. I have all these guys that are like, you know, who are you? And yes, there was a, a terrible name that was given, you know, it, was the, it wasn't even like the pit bull. It was something much worse, but I was like, yeah, I'm going for what I believe in. Well, what I learned from that is that, yes, I broke through the glass ceiling, but it wasn't what I really wanted. I was doing it in spite. I was doing it because I was competitive as hell. I was doing it for all the wrong reasons. And then I got it and I was miserable. And I want to say how many people go for something because they're next in line. They feel that it's, it's their right. They feel like, yes, this is something that, you know, I deserve. And then you're not happy when you get there. Right. And that's what happened to me. And so it actually really solidified. I did that for almost a year and I had one of the worst years of my own personal life. And after that, it was when Ray Lane called me up and said, do you want to come do this you know, talk? And I'm like, yes, I had another baby. I'm like, yes, I do. So, I, you know, it's interesting. Um, so the, the glass ceiling and I'm glad, you know, where you where you are there, it's breaking. But for a lot of women and, and now actually men and, you know, with diversity and with everything, there are glass ceilings being created that, you know, we don't want to just break the glass ceiling and the shards of glass go everywhere. We want to make sure that we are intentionally setting ourselves up for, I talked about lifestyle success, making sure what you're going for, what you're doing is ultimately in line is three HQ head. I want it. I want it. I need it. I have to have that heart. Yeah. But is that really the direction? And then the highest self is an interesting component of this because a lot of times people think, oh, this is um, a religious thing. And it's not. Highest self is really the best version of you. It's when you're operating in flow. It's when things are, are coming together. And Again, had I taken myself through 3HQ and the framework, I would have realized this was this was one of the worst decisions that I had ever made. So um, why did you study psychology and neuroscience? And I, I gather from reading the book, it's a combination of your your parents were got divorced, your house was being robbed. Uh, your mom was the most resilient person you could possibly interact with. And, you know, what eventually happened to your mom. So was that why you ended up studying psychology and neuroscience for all the, the, the problems that you encountered? Actually, I did what so many people do. You go into college, you think about your parents or you think about somebody you know and say, okay, I'm going to do that. So I decided my dad was a doctor, orthopedic surgeon. My grandfather was a doctor, orthopedic surgeon. I was going to be a doctor. So I went in, I was pre-med and within the first year I was miserable. And my dad, God love him, God rest his soul. He said, Hillary, I don't care what you end up doing, but you're out of state tuition. You've got to graduate in four years. So make it, make it happen. 
So I went to um, my advisor, Mr. Nishikawa, and he said, you've got two choices with the classes that you take and the fact that you want to do a study abroad, psychology or anthropology. And I'm like, okay, so there you have it. I need to be able to get out in four years. And I had already done pre-med for one year. I ended up doing psychology. And as I sat in those classes, unlike a lot of the pre-med classes, I was mesmerized by it. I loved every bit of each and every class. And it is then that I started to, and my mom, my dear sweet mom who passed way too soon, she ended up crazy enough giving me a book uh, that was The Secret. I'm and sure. it was an interesting, she's like, I was, I was down and out. I was crushed by my divorce. I was crushed by all these things. And she had never seen me not be able to be resilient. And you know her story. She was like, as you said, one of the most resilient people in the world of what she had to go through. And so I actually read that book in one sitting. And there was a gentleman in the book named um, John Asaraf. And it talked about how to manifest. And I thought, uh, and I was science-based. I love numbers, give me the study. And all of a sudden I'm hearing about law of attraction and I'm like, what the heck? And so I thought, you know what? At this point, I have nothing to lose. I'm going to try this thing. And I took a piece of paper out, jotted down. I want to meet John Asaraf. I want to actually be one of his coaches for his CEOs that he brings into his top tiered course. I want to do that. I'm going to, and then and I did one step more besides saying, and I want to do this in six weeks. I put down what I would actually teach these people had I have, if I have an opportunity to go in front of this elite group of CEOs, just jotted it down very high level, put it away, actually put it, folded it and put it in the book. Well, six weeks later, almost to the day, I walk into this building and there is John Asaraf. I mean, you can imagine, I am like, I am over the top excited. I mean, I'm like that, I, I felt like I've known him for hundreds of years. Like, I, I'm like, yes, there he is. I walk right up to him and I say, you know, John, it is so great to meet you. He of course looks at me like, who are you crazy lady? I say, okay, I read this. And of course everyone goes up to him and say, I read this. And then I said, and I manifested this meeting right now. I said, you don't know this, but you're actually gonna hire me. I'm gonna coach your top people, all this stuff. Well, it ends up, he was my mentor for, now it's been almost 15 years, I'd say, for all of my neuroscience. And he was the one who got me in to take my year long study course around neuroscience. And so it all blended in, but no, it, it you know, you open yourself up to opportunity and possibility and you don't close yourself off and it's amazing what will come. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. By the way, can you tell us how to spell John's last name? Asaraf is A-S-S-A-R-A-F. And he has a fabulous program called NeuroGym. And he just launched an incredible app, Inner Size. Inner Size. And it's an app where you get these bite-sized, two-minute uh, little snippets of, you know, mindset for anything, whether it's weight gain, finance, any of your limiting beliefs. And we work, we work very closely together because he has this, you know, quick hit and I have, I have a quick hit that's going to be, you know, we're, we're working together on some very cool things. So um, I want to ask you this, what is more important, IQ or EQ, emotional intelligence to being a successful leader? I mean, I think that people always wonder what, what's more important today in leading people. Mm, so really, if you think about IQ, it came out in the 60s and 70s. It was a really big deal. How smart are you? Uh, you know, how cognitively, you know, are you able to have um, problem solving? And then in the late 80s, 90s, EQ became a really big buzzword. And it was all about emotional quotient and which one makes more sense. Does it make more sense to be as a leader, you know, more on the IQ side or the EQ side? Here's what happened in, uh, and it's been over, I think now, uh, 2013, 11 years since Sheryl Sandberg, the former COO of Facebook Meta, 
she wrote the book lean in yep and so at that point it became all about like okay it's not iq it's eq it needs to be you know one or the other you've got to be really focused and get the seat at the table and i'm thinking i did that i did it and it was a total disaster and so what i started to position is it's not about choosing and selecting one or the other 3hq is about the iq the head and it's about the eq the heart and it's merging them together. It's an ever loop. It's a continuous process where there are times where we have to have the systems and the structure in place. But then there's times where you have to show empathy and people feel like one or the other is either very masculine, very feminine. And I can raise my hand and say, during my Oracle days, I look like this, but I was absolutely working in my masculine energy. I was all about you know the the tasks the i've got to get this done the you know i was going to roll over anything to get to that next position well it didn't go so well right all of a sudden i'm like i'm miserable i'm i'm feeling like i've got everything on the outside but inside i'm crumbling and so 3hq and that the headquarters of yourself and being able to realize that in the head we've got our thoughts You've got your empowering thoughts that are awesome. I don't want you to touch those. Those are your strengths. Those are your like, hey, I'm a great communicator. I'm a great, you know, I've got, I'm really great at numbers. I'm really good at structure. I'm really good with people, whatever that is. And then you've got the idea that there are those limiting beliefs, the ones that hold you back, the ones that sometimes we don't even know exist. I call them bugs your beliefs underground surfacing. We all have bugs. We all have limiting beliefs that if we could get rid of them, it's like Ghostbuster. If we could get rid of them, where would that allow us to go? How successful, how much would that like that? How much is that limiting belief holding us back? So when you think about your bug, whether, and there's always three main bugs, every single thing that you think about as a limiting belief. I'm too old. Um, I'm not smart enough. I've never done this. I don't think I can do that. My family never got this far. I can't, you know, imagine growing a company past six figures, seven figure, eight figures, whatever the limiting belief is, stems into three primary limiting beliefs. And that is, I need to be safe. I need to be loved. And I'm not good enough. So they all are like tentacles back to those three. So when you think about your head and you've got this like, you've got the, you know, it's almost like the angel and the devil. You've got these, these two different limiting beliefs, empowering beliefs. We have to be very much thoughtful about awareness around what's going on. If you don't have something in your life right now and you've been going for it and you've been trying to, you know, create this, there's a reason. And nine out of 10 times, it's based around the limiting belief. You take the limiting belief out and all of a sudden things open up for you. And so then you look at your heart, cause that's again, IQ, I can think it, I understand the awareness. Then you look at the heart and your why. And, and there's a lot of people out there, you know, some of the biggest gurus and I, you know, some of them have just amazing processes, but there's so much of this you got to love your life. You got to love your, you got to love everything about everything. You got to love your work. Well, I know firsthand that I didn't love anything in my life. I was just, I was completely on the opposite side. So for me, trying to go from self-sabotage, I really hate what's going on, but nobody knows it to I love everything was like evil Knievel trying to jump over and you know his fate. So many yeah, right. Facts, right. So I decided that, okay, what if I didn't try to make that huge leap? I just went from, all right, I'm really not happy. I'm really unsatisfied to just like, let me just like some areas about my life. And from there it went to love. From there, it helps. So you got the head, the heart coming together, which then allows for you to get up to that highest self where your energy, and that's the key. We all know those days that we feel like, you know, I've got no energy, I'm burned out, I'm feeling underwhelmed, overwhelmed, stuck. 
And when we're feeling that, there's something called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is on high alert. It's the it's it's inside of you that's basically monitoring the fight, the flight. And so in today's world, so many of us are living in that environment all the time. Well, if you're living in that environment all the time, you're not able to create within yourself your own natural neurotransmitters, your own hormones that are in your body to be able to increase your dopamine, your oxytocin, your serotonin, your endorphins, because the vagus nerve is on fight or flight and it's not allowing those things to take place in your body. So we got to calm via this whole concept of 3HQ, getting out of your head, identifying like, why am I so stressed right now? What is going on? Why do I feel like this uneasiness in my body all the time? How can I how can I how can I feel better about myself and elevate myself out of this low vibrational energy? Remember, everything, every emotion has a vibration to it. This is science, every single. So if you're sad, you're mad, you're angry, low vibration. So in order to create, have success, have that joy in your life, we got to elevate you to a higher level, right? Makes sense. But we've got to first and foremost have that idea. People are like, you know, Hillary, what do you think about meditation? I'm like, I think we all have to pause during the day because if we don't, the vagus nerve will stay on high alert and you're not allowing for the really good, the richness, the wonderful, you know, natural drugs that we have inside of us. And that's what I teach my executives how to do. So you write that 6,000 thoughts go through our mind every day. I, I don't know if I have 6,000 thoughts. And if I do, probably 90% of them are all the same thought. 85% uh, are negative. Why is that? Okay, so it's super interesting. Neuroscience is changing a lot. We're learning a lot more throughout the years. And in the last few years, it used to be, and many of you might have even heard, people were saying, and I learned this, originally that we had 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day, 85% are negative, hardwired in us from caveman days where we had to, you know, watch out something is going to kill us, mm -hmm. something is going to eat us. And what's happened is through scans, we have learned that there are not 60 to 80,000, there are approximately 6,250 thoughts per day. Now that's still a ton of thoughts. But what really is unique and different here is that your subconscious allows us, and you said, I don't know if I have that many thoughts. No, because what it's done is it has created these pathways that you don't have to think about. So why do you all of a sudden you're driving and you just get home and you're like, how the heck did I just get home? Why are you so programmed in the morning that your morning routine is, I go to the bathroom, I brush my teeth, I have my coffee. I mean, you're very programmed. We're not thinking about these things because if you had to think about every single thing that you were doing, all of these thoughts, you would not have enough glucose feeding you energetically to be able to even get off the couch, to be able to get out of bed. So what we have learned by this is that your subconscious has two things that it does. It keeps you safe and it keeps you familiar, familiar. It wants to take everything that you do, all of your habits and create these very easy processes for you. So you don't have to think about anything. It's already doing it even before you hear something or before you, you know, are even consciously aware. It's already like, oh, I've already, I already have an idea about that. I already know how I'm going to do that. And so your subconscious, and this is why so many people say, how come I get, I, I have the greatest quarter. I get like the best revenue and then I completely stall out. How come all of a sudden everything is going so great for me? And then all of a sudden it's not, is it that like, I can't have that kind of happiness? Is it that like, you know, it's just, there's no such thing as having every area of my life great. And so your beliefs are in your subconscious and your beliefs are what is going to keep you at your identity. So how do we create these beliefs? A thought 
and an emotion continuously thought over and over. So think about your little kid and you're learning money doesn't grow on trees. You got to work really hard. You got to, you know, play hard and, you know, work hard. All these things that you can kind of go back and like, oh my God, I hear my dad, I hear my mom, or, you know, I hear my teacher, or I hear my friends. Those became your belief system. So when you think about who you are today and your identity, is, hey, well, this is where I am. And everything that you're doing is going to keep you at the level of your beliefs because your beliefs are 100% factual to you. So for people that all of a sudden are like, gosh, I can't crack the seven figure, eight figure, nine figure. I just can't do it. Limiting belief. And until you get that limiting belief and actually belief blast it, get rid of it, And it's not like everyone's like, is this a fast process? No, it might've taken you 50 years, 60 years to get that limiting belief from when you were five years old. It takes 62 to 67 days to have a limiting belief actually break apart with a new empowering belief. But here's the thing, people are like, oh my God, Hillary, 62 to 67 days, too long. And I say, okay, but I got you. I can actually give you something, and it's probably my number one business hack for peak performance, and you can do this as many times during the day, and it will give you the result, the instantaneous quick fix, the silver bullet that you've been asking for. So So I I wonder this, um, why do people go through a midlife crisis, and should they embrace that period? and put a positive spin on it. I mean, men and women go through midlife crisis, not just uh, men going through it. So how do you embrace this change? Because you mentioned in the very beginning that we're all kind of in that space. Um, So what do you tell uh, people? And I think a lot of the audience here is exactly in that space. In fact, I think most all the audience is over the age of 50 uh, Mm -hmm. that's listening to you today. Okay, so here's what I want you all to think about. And I talked about your identity, right? The thoughts, the emotions repeated over time, create your belief system and you can't rise above your belief system. That's your identity. So what happens when we get to the mid zone, as I call it, is that we start to think about where we thought we would be at this time in our life. And this crisis comes from, oh my God, I thought I would have this at this point. I thought I would be making this at this point. I thought my relationship would be like this. And all of a sudden the reality, you start to look around and you're like, no, I'm not where I thought I would be. But here's the thing, it's not the crisis, the midlife crisis that's happening. Because again, you control your thoughts. You have the ability to control your thoughts. This is one of the most incredible things that I want everyone to realize that You're only where you are because of what you're thinking, but it's not a midlife crisis. It's an identity crisis that you're having, right? You're, you thought you were going to be somewhere and you're not. So as soon as we can start to realize, so what exactly do you really want at this point? What is missing? What are you still going for? What are your dreams? What are your like aspirations before this life is taken from you? And when we can start to identify what I call your scazy goals, your scary and crazy goals that are like, whoa, if I could have that happen. And that's the magic of what I do. Once we figure that out, there's no midlife crisis. We go right for creating a new identity of a person that could actually have what you're looking for, which means we have to create better thoughts. We have to create the emotions energetically in order to bounce you up to a higher level energetically. There is an incredible law out there called the law of resonance. And when you're feeling like you're in this crisis mode, you're operating again at that low energetic level. The vibration is low scientific everybody here so what do we have to do we have to get you up to a higher level energetically so that what you ultimately want more success financial freedom more time with the family 
you're able to do that because energetically, vibrationally, we're moving you up. And it's a really super process, easy as can be. It's the byproduct of 3HQ framework, head, heart, highest self. And it's literally called tune in. And it's the tune in power tool, tune in. It's four easy steps. And it's the simplest way to start to incorporate yourself into that ability that you can create your own energy on demand, no matter what relaunches are going through your mind. Well, I think it's incredibly uh, struggle. People struggle a lot with all of that. Uh, I know I uh, I didn't necessarily struggle with that, but I didn't decide to uh, go to Asia and I'm teaching in Hanoi, Vietnam because I wanted uh, to tackle something new, even at 62 then, now 63. Wanted to try something totally different um, because I felt I was getting stale. And so a lot of my friends are like, are you nuts? Like, why would you move all the way to Asia, including my kids? But I felt like life is so short and it has gone by in a blink that if I didn't embrace this and try it, I would I would regret it. And I think my whole life has been writing books, everything. It's all about I don't want to regret something. And my daughter is trying, my one daughter is trying to make it in Hollywood and I said, I'll support you uh, to go and chew it because I'm on a psychiatrist couch wondering what if, you know, <laughs> to go and try that. Uh, question hey. from the audience. Could you please talk a little more about vibrations and how to increase one's vibration? Mm. Vibration, I guess, vibration. So what I want to share with you is that if, if we think about who we are, we are energetic beings, right? If you all of a sudden are having a heart attack, what do they do? They take the fibrillation, fib, or what's it called? What I just totally, the fibrate, you know that machine, that put you, you know that thing, okay? And what is it sending out? Electrical currencies. It's going to stimulate you out of the, the fact that your heart is slowing down and it's going to activate it. This is all a part of what I'm talking about. So if we are electrical, if we are vibrational, I want you to think about tuning forks. And when you think about a tuning fork, if I were to put a kitchen fork together with a tuning fork and I hit them, nothing happens, right? But if I bring a tuning fork and another tuning fork and I hit, I click them, all of a sudden one starts to vibrate at the same level. If I were to hug you for 30 seconds with our hearts together, our hearts would start to beat at the same pace. And so when we understand this, and when you understand that there are a billion neurons in our brain, a billion, and there are these neurons called mirror neurons. So think about this. When you see somebody yawn, what do you do? You yawn. Even when you see somebody, you're at a movie and you see somebody cry, it starts to get you to tear up. So there's a study that was done with monkeys and they put these two monkeys together and they gave one monkey these peanuts and the monkey cracked the peanut and they both had electrodes on their head and the monkey that was cracking it and eating it lit up in the brain the other monkey that was just watching this other monkey eat had the same areas in the brain lit up so how do we leverage this? And I was talking about law of resonance. When you want something and you don't have it, it means that it's, op it's, it's actually at a higher vibrational level. Um, Albert Einstein had the greatest quote. And it took me a long time to really understand this. He said, you can't solve a problem at the conscious level it was created. You can't solve a problem at the conscious level it was created. So how do we elevate ourselves to be able to solve why we're stuck in certain areas of our personal life, professional life? How do we rise above? And so I want to go into really quickly, tune in. Tune in is the automatic start to access the tune in part of it immediately and here are the four steps and mark can i just use you as a guinea pig right now just so of course. people can understand what i'm doing okay tune in again we need to elevate ourselves it's all about 3hq so step one is the head and step one is 
I'm going to ask you, Mark, what is the biggest challenge that you have going on in your business right now? What's the biggest challenge? Uh, biggest challenge would be making more income. Okay. So you want to make more money. Okay. Always. So with that, making more money, I want to make more money energetically because he doesn't feel like he's at the level that he wants to be. There's a lower vibrational level. If Mark had all the money he could ever want or need or he's ha so happy, he wouldn't be at this lower energetic level saying, I want to make more money. Okay. So again, head, very head focused. We then go into step two, which is change the channel. This is highest self. This is where Mark is going to tell me a song that lights him up when he hears it. Music. What song, when you hear it, Mark, you cannot be at a low vibrational level. It lights you up. What would that song be? Uh, Luck Be a Lady by Frank Sinatra. Okay. Oh, that's such a good one. Luck Be a Lady. Okay. I want you to think about the song. If we weren't on this show right now, you could play it on your, your phone or out in the, you know, you could hear it. But the greatest part about our brains is that you can also think it. So I want you, Mark, to think think the song to change your channel. It's your power song. And you're literally going to tune into the song and you're going to take the song from your head to your toes, but you're changing your state. I want you to move. So think about luck be a lady. Come on, move your body, Mark. Oh, I have no. <laughs> turn it up. Turn it up. Come on, turn it up in your head. Uh huh. It's all up. <laughs> now neuroscience. And I want everyone else, everyone else to be thinking about their song, hearing it, feeling it and you have to do this for at least 20 seconds that's the neuroscience behind it so from there after we've moved our body we've tuned into this song we are now at a higher level step three is all about the heart and this is where we create that mini movie in your mind of you actually mark having as much money, it is coming in, you're getting clients, it's just like flowing in for you. Like, wow, I never could have imagined this. It is happening. You are on a stage, you are seeing everybody out there and there's a color that you're wearing. There's a color in this mini movie. And what color is that? What color are you seeing? Either you're wearing it or you're seeing it. I personally like black. Okay, I want you to intensify the black. It almost starts to look shiny. It's so intense for you, this black color. And now what I want you to do is, what is the emotion behind? Tune back into Luck Be A Lady, tune back into that song. And what is the emotion you're feeling on the stage as you're seeing the thousands of people in the audience, they all want whatever you're selling, whatever you're doing, they just wanna give you money. How are you feeling about this? Oh, of course, amazing. Amazing. I want you to 10X that amazingness. 10X the color, intensify everything in this image, tuning in to luck be a lady. And now we're gonna do a technique that is again, going to capture this. And a lot of times we look for outside visualization. I want you to go internal and you're gonna take a picture in your mind of this image. When I say click, it's like the shutter of a camera, but it's going to go internal. You're going to open and close your eyes, taking that internal picture, the billboard on Times Square. This is the shot, the money shot. So I want you to open and close your eyes when I say click, 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 click. Intensify it again. There are your pictures. You are literally now capturing that moment in time. And as we go to step four, we're back in the head. This is where you do the micro action. The micro action is what is one, you tune back into your song, what is one thing that you can do, success like speed? One thing you can do when we get off this call, what could you go do, tune back in, that would allow you to get one step closer to that visualization, that image of you in your black on stage, you are crushing it. What's one thing you could do right now? Tune back in. Think about that one uh, thing, because I think it's a more complex question than the one, the one thing in my particular case. Okay, but here's the thing. You're overthinking this. I want, right. you, 
I want you, because you're logically based. Yes. This is where you're very much left brain. I want you to be thinking, stop right now. You're trying to create wealth. You're trying to create, generate additional revenue in your business. What, what's coming up for you as you're tuning in, because you're tuning into that highest self, that gut feeling, that intuitiveness of like, I actually know what I need to do. I just haven't been doing it. So stop overthinking this. And what is that one small thing? I don't want you to, it's so big, small, small, small. What could you do? And tune back into the song because there is scientific evidence about song, about art that elevates us. What could it, it, you do? I think be less logical. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. Okay. okay, so what could you do to be less logical? What would you do? I don't know. I ask a lot of friends that because all the ideas I have are very, they always say your ideas are very logical and make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And they're stumped about why they don't take off. And so friends of mine said, we have, you have to stop being so logical. I just saw a friend the other day and she said, this is a brilliant idea. It's not going to work. Um, because she said, for some reason, you need to think totally different mm -hmm. than uh, your logical progression about how things should work. So I'm struggle with that and have been struggling with that. Okay, so, so how it requires do you, a longer conversation. How do you get into your creative zone? I, I, my creative zone is working all the time. I'm like a popcorn machine for ideas. I mean, I'm constantly. <laughs> okay, so yeah. hold on. Yeah. Popcorn machine for ideas. Yeah. So what if your tune in micro action was right after this call? to think about one, two, or three new ways to create money. You say you're a popcorn machine for ideas. I'm working on exactly that now. I have a, uh, one in the uh, AI space okay. uh, that we're working on. It's called Business Plan Factory. Yeah. And you can get a, a business plan in 15 minutes. Just write okay. one sentence. Awesome. Okay, so stop there. What I want you to think about is if you use the tune-in process, not just one time during the day, maybe three times. And in one week, you would have done 15 micro actions for that AI. How long would it take you before you could put that out there and start generating money? Well, we actually already put it out there. So, so give, me I, another, I, I give me another example. One that's just coming to you like you've been thinking about, it's a crazy idea or not a crazy. What's one other? Because you've already done that one. I want to show yeah, you what yeah. I'm talking about. Sure, sure. So I, I have uh, another idea Mm -hmm. on the AI space where you can take all of the negative comments that are on the web about whatever yeah. your business is, like yeah. on Yelp, yeah. and that our AI would give you a list of all the feedback you've gotten and then advise you on how to uh, take advantage of that negative feedback and turn that around to- Okay, stop. Them. Yeah. So right now, everybody on this call, put in the chat. Is that something, yes, you would like or no, you wouldn't? Just put it in there. So now, after you see this, let's go ahead, just really quickly look at this. What do you think? Is that something that you would want potentially to even pay for because that's something that's so incredible? What's happening is I want you to now know that your song, Luck Be A Lady, is associated with potentially any new, and it says, yeah, yes. So any new idea you have on making money, you immediately go through the tune in process and say, what's next here? What's next here? What's my next micro action? Now, here's the thing. I don't know how much more time we have. Um, we here. have uh, 10 minutes and I do have a question I want to get th okay. through for okay. the audience. Okay, let me just quickly say this. What I haven't shared with you is that for each one of these stages, remember I talked about dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. When we're doing the tune-in process, you're actually releasing dopamine when you're thinking of your challenge, the reward system. You're actually releasing oxytocin when you are tuning into your song. You're actually releasing and increasing the ability to create serotonin when you're creating your visualization and then 
endorphins come out when you do your micro action. So you are fueling yourself with these neurotransmitters, with these incredible hormones to make you happier, more joyful, more content. So the more you can tune in around all areas of your business, put it on your calendar. It takes less than 60 seconds. And it again is the number one peak performance habit that I teach. Interesting. And I would like to have a further conversation about this. We have a question from the audience. Any thoughts on the law of attraction? So law of attraction, and thank you for asking that. I talked about the law of resonance. When it resonates with you, you create something and you are, you're creating it from your tune in process. Energetically, you're higher, you're feeling good. So when you create that, whether it's an email, whether it's a lead magnet, whether it is a financial document, whether it is you're about to go live on Instagram or whatever you're doing, when you're creating it from a higher higher level of resonance, it will resonate with ideal client, with who you ultimately want to be hearing your message. Law of attraction flows into law of resonance. Law of resonance is actually a much bigger, a much bigger concept. Law of attraction is what you think, what you want, you can attract. Now, let me just clarify so you really understand. We talked about the subconscious brain. There is an area in your brain called the reticular activation system. You think, uh, don't hit the pole. Don't hit the pole. What happens? You hit the pole right? Because what's happening in your brain is that when you put out there very clearly, tune in very clearly what you want, the RAS goes to work in finding that for you. Because again, we're only using such a small part of our brain. And so what we want to be doing is feeding it with what you want, what you want to manifest. What do you want to have come into your life? That's where this gets so exciting because people are like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that. That's for that person. I can't do that. Well, what are you thinking? Your thoughts are energetic. Your thoughts resonate out there with what ultimately you're going to get back. And if you're like, I'm a failure. I can't do this. I've no, nobody in my family has ever been able to do this. Then that's what you're going to get back. So we want to make sure that we are putting out there in the tune in process. It's either a challenge for step one or an intention. I'll give you a great example. Before I came on the show, there were some issues going on with a very large um, construction going on. It was like jackhammering. I'm like, oh my God, Mark, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know if you can hear that. He's like, no, 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 it's okay. But I had already in my mind said, okay, I'm tuning in to delivering for, it doesn't matter if I have one person that really resonates with the tune in or all of you. My goal is to make an impact here with the tune in process. So I went through my challenge. My intention is how am I going to impact you in an easy, simple way? I have my, my power song, I went through the visualization of having you guys say that, you you know, Hillary, you got to bring her back on, even if it's in a year when your next slot is available, Mark. But then my action step was I immediately turned on and I went into meeting up with Mark. Guess what happened? Within five minutes, the outside jackhammer stopped. It's not going on. And that's because, again, You don't even realize what happens with how you're thinking. And as you build up your tune in, I've got, I've got people that are, um, you know, crushing it. Uh, One, one guy just sold his business for $200 million and he is now tuning in before every single meeting, before everything that he's doing, he has on his calendar a minute before to be able to tune in. Well, I thank you for answering that. And I think that's the, um, a case with a lot of people was trying to figure that out. Also, when manifesting, um, doesn't everybody kind of manifest? You know, they all have this idea in their head that they're going to try to accomplish, and yet it still doesn't ha- happen for them. So, for the people who actually buy into it and feel frustrated, what do you tell them? So, it's very interesting. Um, I would say 
probably a good 30 to 40% of people I work with, their limiting belief is actually around success. Like what happens if I actually get to be really successful? They're afraid of success. They're afraid of success. And so I've heard that before. So for those people and for people that are truly, they realize that they are in control of their thoughts. And there's a great quote that I often love to use. And he's a mentor of mine. His name is Jim Fortin. And he says, you are not your thoughts. You are the thinker of your thoughts. And if that's the case, answer this. When I ask, if I were to say, what, how would you finish this sentence? I am, I am. How would you finish that? Okay, uh -huh. I, am, I am a mom, I am a wife, I am a you know, CEO, I am, I am, I am. Good person, yeah. But, yeah, a good person. But there's also some of those that, you know, how are you, how are you talking to yourself? Because a lot of times people are like, gosh, I've been trying to manifest this. I've been doing everything. I've been doing everything that I was told in the secret. I've been doing everything I was told in all of these different seminars and courses and things like that. And it, I still don't have it. What am I doing wrong? What you're doing wrong is that your brain, your subconscious is keeping you exactly where you're supposed to be. You can work like crazy to try to manifest. And as long as your belief system is still holding you back, you may have that moment of success, but it's not sustainable. Because again, your subconscious is going to continue to keep you in that safe place. Your brain, your, your subconscious doesn't know the difference between something good and something bad. It's just keeping you in that familiar zone. So it's such a, it's so fascinating because I literally have seen people who come to me and say, I've never been able, I'll give you a great example. This woman came and said, I've never been able to get past $250,000 a year. I said, well, what are you really hoping for? She's like, I want a seven figure company. So we went through the process and we went into more detail. We got rid of one of her bugs. And from there, she ended up having, remember I talked about scazy goal, your scary and crazy goals, these manifestation things you're trying to bring into your life within 90 days, 90 days, she had already blown out her revenue number and within the year hit the seven figure. That's because we cleared out, we cleared out all the junk. We allowed her to actually say, this is what I really want. But we got into the, well, why don't you have it? Why don't you have it already? It's because you've got your limiting beliefs. But here's the best part, you can tune in. And as I said, Mark, if you were to tune in three times a day at the end of the week, five days, you probably work seven, but five, you'd have 18. Six, micro, yeah. yeah. Okay, six, Yeah. right? You'd have 18 micro actions done towards that goal. Then you do it the next week and the next week and all of a sudden, you have you have moved forward even just one tune in per day 365 micro actions will you be closer heck yes so it's just it's it's incredibly fascinating once you become aware that you have this within you once you learn how to, which you've already learned you guys are, I'm, I'm donning you all like boom you're all masters in tune in you now understand it you can now leverage it so here's my last question for you. And I had a whole bunch of questions for you that we just never got to uh, today. But your explanations were great. And clearly from people's response here, they've really enjoyed this hour. So my very last question is, how can people hold themselves accountable when coming up with an idea for a new product, service, or change of career without just talking about it and never moving forward? Because I know a lot of people who I've known for years talk about stuff, but they just never move themselves forward. Yeah. So here's what we have to do. There is a lot of good ways and bad ways to have goal setting. And unless you are, and, and you've all heard of smart goals, right? Yeah. I don't believe in smart goals to the degree that you just leave it at smart. What I do is I have them as smarty goals, I and an E, and the I is your identity. You got to be focused on the person who's actually going to have that success. And then the E is the environment, the environment that you're putting yourself, the encouragement from the environment. That's what 
allows you to continue the journey. I use a lot of old school wisdom. You talk about Napoleon Hill writing about a hundred of the most successful people and what were their commonalities. I merge those with contemporary. Like how do you actually leverage these things that have been known and worked throughout time? How do you take ancient wisdom? How do you take universal laws like we were asking about, you know, law of attraction and how do you make those work in your business? So when you're up against something that seems daunting, seems like, God, I've been trying to do this, you go after it via this idea of what's the identity that would allow you to get there. You tune in. For those that are just starting out, I say you tune in once a day. Then you go to three times. Then you go to five times. And once you're at five times, I've got you. Because then you want to just start doing it as much as possible. I tune in at, at a minimum 20 times a day. So that's how you're able to do it. Tori, thank you so much for spending the time. These people are all now lit up for the weekend. <laughs> so happy. Be, yeah. So, and, and are you, I'm imagining you're a motivational speaker as well. So how often are you speaking and do you make it to a lot of the audiences from the East Coast? How often do you make it out there to speak? Well, I actually am on a show, a morning show that I fly out there and it's on every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's called Wake Up with Marcy and Hillary. It's a TV show. And I get out to the East Coast all the time. I do a lot of speaking, um, you know, because again, this is um, not specific to any industry, right? And so, of course. Yeah. So I, I, and where's you know, your show I'm all at? over. Uh, it's, it, okay, so you can actually check it out. Wake up with Marcy and Hillary. Again, it's a TV morning show. We have great. In fact, John Asaraf is going to be a guest. I just did. Um, I just did Kevin O'Leary interviewed him. Um, and so you can check it out by going to wake up with Marcy and Hillary.com and it lists out every single location of where you can watch it. And if you're in New York or the tri state Saturday mornings. Wonderful. Hillary, thank you so much for taking the time. Everyone, thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing you next Friday. Thanks again, everyone.